and welcome to this uh, afternoon session. We have some, uh, just a couple of announcements to make before uh, we start. Uh, can you see my screen? So, um, we would like again to tell you about the HCA project registry. So you can join a, the HCA community using this link. Uh, there will be a short survey link about this event at the chat, which is gonna post it after this uh, presentation. So you can help us improve the HCA events in the future. The recordings are gonna be available by logging into the events uh, website. So it's the same website as the Human Cell Atlas and there is a, a place where you click on events and it's going to be there in the very near future. And two upcoming meetings, the HCA Kidney Bionetwork Seminar and the HCA Developmental and Pediatric Cell Atlas meeting also upcoming, okay? We will share with you uh, these uh, links the survey, the HCA Slack um, uh, for you guys to join. There are many interesting um, um, protocols and conversations over, over there, so uh, it's really worth it. And the email also for you guys to write to us after this event so we can uh, engage in discussions about uh, future uh, collaborations. So with that, Henrique is going to introduce our speakers. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. Well, we are moving on to the lightning talks for today. We, we will be having uh, very interesting talks uh, and we will be starting with the talk by Juan, Juan Diego Ariza from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. So, uh, Juan Diego, we, we can hear you. I okay, hi, hi everyone. Welcome um, and it's all yours. Thank you. I'm gonna share my my slides. So, um, hi everyone. Um, this talk is called "Comparison of Dimensionality Reduction Methods for Simulated Single Cell Data," a work by me, Juan Diego Ariza, and Professor Liliana Lopez from the Department of Statistics. So, this is the the agenda, and let's start. First, a um, from the single cell data, uh, the main advantage is that we now have the information of each cell individually. But uh, the challenge, the, the great challenge is how to extract valuable information from sparse but high dimensional data to reveal new cell types, dynamics or regulation. So as you can see here in the final part of the workflow, uh, we have this high dimensional matrix of, uh, of single cell expression profiles. Then the statistical challenge is uh, the, 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 the clustering and the dimensionality reduction to find cell types. And for this reason, this work starts um, there with the simulation of this uh, high dimensional matrix. So uh, we we simulate three, three we used three types of simulation. Um, the first one uh, we simulate two two, two batches. So we, we 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 have two original simulated batches. Then we simulate five groups, uh, like simulating cell types, and then we simulate three trajectories. That is, uh, simulate three cell types, but with a structure, like a central node, and then other two um, cell types coming out of this central node. Then we applied the dimensionality reduction. We are gonna compare these three methods. Uh, first one, PCA, the, a linear method of dimensionality reduction for dimensionality reduction. And uh, other two uh, nonlinear methods, UMAP and TISNI. Uh, after that, we uh, apply the clustering with three algorithms. Uh, first one, K means, uh, and the other two graph based uh, algorithms, KNN plus LUVAN and SNN plus LUVAN. The main difference between these two algorithms uh, is that is, is the graph construction. The graph construction. 
Uh, in the first one, we used a uh, K nearest neighbors. And in the other one, we used shared nearest neighbors. And the last part of the workflow is the assessment part. Um, since we have the original simulated groups for each simulation, and after the, 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 the workflow, we have the detected clusters, the detected groups, and then we can compare between the, the original simulated and the detected clusters and see how similar are uh, these clusters. And, and we used the Jakar score to measure that, that how similar are these groups. And, and, we, and then we can say uh, which method has the highest score uh, from these three uh, methods. So our simulation design, it looked like this. Uh, first one, the types of simulation, batches, groups, and trajectories, and each combination of methods and clustering, we simulate 20 times to see how the Jakar scores variate uh, in, in every combination. All the simulations and the dimensionality reduction and clustering was made with the libraries uh, Scatter, Splatter, and Scram. Uh, all from Bioconductor. And now so let's see the results. Mm, after applying, after simulating and, and applying the, the dimensionality reduction, we have these, these graphs. Um, and the first uh, simulate, the, and the first type of simulation is the two original simulated batches. And as you can see in every method and every algorithm, uh, there's no problem to, to find the two batches. So there's, there's no problem in this type of simulation for any method. Uh, but now in the, or in the simulated groups, we can see that there is, uh, there's some problems uh, finding and, and, and looking the separate cell types. The, the simulated cell types in, 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 for example, here in the center of the graph. Uh, but we have to remember that you might, we are just looking the first two dimensions uh, of, of, of every method. For example, UMAP and PCA, the dimensions objective, the, the dimension objective was uh, 14 or, or 15, and we are just looking the first two. So there's information that the Jakar score uh, will, will tell us how good is, the, is the, the dimensionality reduction and clustering. And the final part, uh, the simulated trajectories. Um, for every method, in, in general, we can see that the, the structure, uh, I, I talk about the, the central uh, cell type, the central node, and then uh, two, two others, uh, cell types coming out of this central, uh, like a central node, like a, like a graph. Um, so now let's see the Jakar score, the, the, the results and for batches, uh, as we saw in the, in the graphs, um, there's over every combination of the mean of, uh, of the Jakar score of every combination of clustering and reduction uh, and dimensionality reduction method was over is is over are, are over 95 percent so there's no problem here in batches uh, but in groups um, the 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 highest score uh, change through the uh, clustering algorithms for example here for Disney is the highest then UMAP for KNN and uh, PCA for SNN but uh, we we found that, uh, for example, here in PCA, there's a lot of variation for the Jakar score. And uh, we, for, for this reason, we calculate the median in the margins of the, of the table. And we saw that UMAP has the highest score, has the highest median of the Jakar score. And uh, the clustering algorithms change, uh, for example, in groups, the highest is for uh, the algorithm of SNN and in the trajectories, the highest is for KNN. Uh, 
So this is our, our uh, results that UMAP makes the best representation in low dimensions and that it is valid to use different clustering algorithms depending on prior information. Um, and the, for future work, we, we, we see that a choose hyperparameters is crucial. It's a, it's, a, it's a crucial step for how good is the, is the dimensionality reduction and also for the clustering algorithms. So this is a, a, a future work um, for, for, for looking the, 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 how good is the, the dimensionality reduction uh, for, for example, UMAP. Mm, and this is the, the references and thank you very much. Thank you, Juan, for presenting this, uh, this talk. Uh, we have one question and it's actually related with the way you deal with uh, the differences in the assumptions on the different clustering methods. So do, do you uh, make some, some kind of adjustment, let's say to take into account that PCA is a linear versus a stochastic or versus uh, normalized methods such as TISNEA and, and UMAP? Yes, yes, we, um, we uh, because we simulate the, the data, the data um, for, for every method, we, we used uh, an, 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 an a, diff a different uh, shoes of hyperparameters. Well, for, for PCA, there's no hyperparameters, but we, we um, like, we choose the number of dimensions that accumulates a certain a percentage of the variation, uh, but for UMAP, for example, there's there's a, 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 a quite interesting uh, like a step because we uh, choose the combination of hyperparameters that maximize the jacquard score. So um, we we use the normalization and then we uh, calculate through iter iterations the, 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 the combination of the hyperparameters. So uh, then we can maximize the Jacquard score, but uh, that's because we simulate the data and then we can know um, the, 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 the combinations and we can compare to the original simulated groups, but uh, that's 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 why we 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 have for for real data we have to uh, look for for some some method to choose the hyperparameters because UMAP is 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 very sensitive to the uh, to the, the hyperparameters. Okay, well, thank you, Juan. Uh, we we have to move on, but if anyone say, has uh, another question or want to discuss about this, this uh, presentation by Juan, uh, you could do it by the chat or even in the later uh, breakout session. So thank you, Juan, uh, for your presentation. Thank you we very are, much. We, we are moving on to the second presentation of, of these uh, lightning talks for today. And it is time for Martin Loza from the University of Tokyo. And he will be talking about uh, his uh, talks. So please, uh, Martin. Uh, feel welcome. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Let me share my slides. Can you see my slides there? Yes. Okay. Let me just move this here. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, to join for joining today. Uh, yeah, I'm Martin Losa from the University of Tokyo, and I'm gonna talk about my research name accurate integration of single cell transcriptome replicates. Today's uh, outline starts with a just short description of what a single cell batch fix uh, in the multi-batch analysis. I will introduce Kanek, an algorithm I designed to, to correct batch effects in this kind of technology. I will show you two main results from my research. One in the scenario of known cell types, and the last one in the scenario of known batch effect. And I will end my presentation with stating the main conclusions, and we'll have some time for questions or comments you may have. Well, let's, let's give just a, a really short description of this kind of technology. Uh, if, uh, suppose we have a bunch of cells in, in a tissue, and we want to investigate what kind of cell we have, 
what kind of maybe dynamics are within the tissue. Something really amazing of this uh, new technology, what kind of new technology is that for each single cell in the input from the tissue, the main tissue, we can obtain a distinct, a unique and independent expression profile for each of the cells. And because it's a huge data, as we saw in the last presentation, we will have really high dimensionality data. Then we need to use different machine learning or artificial intelligence methods to reveal the heterogeneity. And now we can compare maybe different, different conditions or maybe some different lineages uh, going on in the, in the main tissue. In the case we have more than one data set or batch, we also call it batch the data set, we can implement this general view of the multi-batch analysis. Basically, we will have some independent pre-processing of the batches of the data sets. Then we will merge them into a step name batch effect correction. And now we can perform joint downstream analysis uh, with different objectives, maybe just compare the gene expression, compare the cell types, pathways. Here, I would like to highlight the batch effect correction as a really important step. And it's important because any change during the correction will directly affect the downstream analysis, thus change the main conclusions or results we can obtain from this analysis. So let's define now what are batch effects. Batch effects are technical differences and they affect each experiment in a different way. We talk about technical differences as maybe different protocols, different times of the sample environmental conditions, even just start handling the, the samples, all these technical differences will sum up and create a distinct batch effect on each sample. We need to correct the batch effects because they can correlate with the real biological differences we are trying to investigate. Let me show you just a, a, a short example to understand how batch effects can hinder this kind of multi-batch analysis. In this case, we have two non-cell types, and we have three batches. One batch will contain only cells uh, from 290 T cells. Another batch will contain only Jorkat cells. And we have a third batch containing 50% Jorkat cells and 50% 290 T cells. Uh, maybe because we know that the, in this case, the biology of the cell type, we will expect one group for each of the non-cell types. But we can observe that even though the 290 T cells, they have just cluster group in just one really nice distributed cluster of cells. The Jorkat cell has divided into two groups, and these two groups correlate with batch labels. So this tells us that due to some technical differences in the batches, the Jorkat cell has divided into two groups. After minimizing these technical differences of batches, we correctly uh, uh, obtain only one group of cells for each of the known cell types. But what is the problem with batch effect? Well, sometimes, like most of the time, we, we will like to get accurate correction and just obtain one group for each of the known cell types. But sometimes, due to an effect known as overcorrection, the methods can introduce biases. And in this case, the method introduces a third group composed by 290 T cells and Jorkat cells, which is incorrect. So the main problem I, I focus on is that the current state-of-the-art methods, they can introduce biases due to overcorrection. The main objective of my research was to develop a method to integrate data sets coming from replicated experiments and preserve the original biological structure of the data. The main assumption I have is that Batch effects in this kind of technology are mostly linear within a cluster of similar cells. As a result, I developed Kanek, a bioinformatics tool to create batch effect. I'll show you the main step in this workflow. Uh, Kanek starts with two data sets. One will be the reference batch and the other the query batch. And similar to the, the, the scenario I showed you before, cells from the same cell type in this in this case with the same the same color will divide into two groups which correlate with batch labels connect will then uh, cluster the query batch and obtain observations of the batch effect and using these two information we obtain a linear correction vector 
for each of the clusters and using fuzzy logic will interpolate between the linear correction vectors and obtain a unique and independent correction vector for each of the cells in the query bunch. We apply Connect in different scenarios. I show you now uh, the Jorkas scenario, the known cell type scenario we, we saw before. In this case, after applying Connect, uh, we obtain only one, of, or only one group of cells for the Jorkas cells and another for the 280 T cells, as we would expect. But there's two questions here we, we haven't uh, assessed. Number one is after correction, is there any remaining batch effect? And how can we measure, measure over correction? To assess these two questions, we develop the next methodology, which we call a known cell type and known zero batch effects. Uh, uh, what do I mean by zero batch effect? Well, before I showed you that in the multi batch analysis, batch effects appear as differences between batches, between data sets. So if we, start with, if we start with only one batch, we can assume that there are no batch effects. The cells were sequenced together, the cells were sample uh, sequence handling together, so there are no technical differences between them. We can create then two pseudo batches by sampling and integrate them with different methods. The main advantage is that we have a gold standard to compare, and the closer a method is to the original data set, the better. In this case, then, the gold standard will be the original data set. We apply this methodology to two spleen data sets from Tabula Moritz. We first cluster to, to find the group of cells we want to preserve, created two pseudo batches, and integrated with Connect and other popular methods. In the top figure, I show you the result from Connect, and we can compare the distribution of batches. Uh, of clusters, sorry, and the mixing of batches, which are quite similar to the original ones. In the case of another popular method called MNM, if we focus in this area, we see some distortion of the clustering. And moreover, here in the mixing of the pseudo batches, we can observe that this method has distorted the mixing, has changed the, the, the general dynamics. But this uh, as we saw before in the dimensional reduction, this can be really subjective, this kind of uh, visualizations. So we wanted to, to assess them in, more, in a more objective way. Then we obtained two metrics for connect and another eight methods and the gold standard. The first metric will assess the group preservation, the cluster preservation, and the second metric will assess the mixing of the patches. In this figure, I show you the result from the methods, and the gray dashed line corresponds to the gold standard one. Then the, the closer a method is to the intersection of the two lines, the better. In this case, connect harmony, combat seek, and combat were the highest methods. To assess the robustness of the test, we repeated it 10 times, and for each of the time, and for each of the methods, we obtain the two metrics and show you the main results in this plot. Again, if we zoom in into the intersection of the gray dash lines, we can observe the distribution of the metrics of the highest score methods. If we focus now in the pink distribution around here, which is the gold standard one, and the orange distribution, which is the connect one, we can observe that connect is the has the, the closest distribution to the gold standard one. Then I would like to conclude with two main uh, results conclusions. Number one is that existing batch effects correction, they offer a powerful solution to integrate data sets, but they can also introduce biases due to overcorrection. Connect provides a simple but effective solution to this problem. And number two, Connect was the highest score method in a test specifically designed to assess overcorrection. We connect correct batch effects without distortion of the structural cells as compared with a gold standard. Uh, thank you all for listening to me and thank you to all my collaborators. I'm happy to, to reply any questions or to discuss any comments you, you have. Thank you, Martin, for your for your good presentation. Uh, one question that is, that is often 
made in the context of, of bug correcting methods is what happened with, with quite unbalanced methods when, when some of the batches are much uh, larger than, than other batches. So how, how do your method deals with unbalancing of, of the batch sizes? Mm, actually, it depends on the, of, on the balance. I mean, there's, there's some kind of limitation. If it's too small and the other is too big, it's, it's quite different. It's quite difficult. And we will give a warning like, okay, no, it, it's not possible in this case. But in most of the cases, we focus more in the clusters, more than in the number of cells of the distribution. So we focus to preserve the cluster. So as long as you, your data set can be clustered, or there's some dynamics there, I think we, we still have like, nice results. So. Mm -hmm. OK, so it does not really depend on, on the, let's say, mm -hmm. dynamic ranges of, of the, of the mm -hmm. values. Yeah, there's some limits. I would say if it's too too small, yeah, yeah, there's nothing we can do. But as long as we can just cluster and find some well-defined clusters, then it's okay. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. thank you, Martin. We we will be moving on, and thank you for okay. your presentation. Uh, thank you. If anyone wants to keep on the conversation, you could do so at the breakout rooms and and at the discussion. And now we're moving on to the next presentation by Ricardo Ramirez from Heidelberg. So Ricardo, please, uh, we are uh, eager to hear your talk. Well, can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Um, so first of all, thanks for the organizers to allowing us to share a bit of our research here. Um, I'm Ricardo Ramirez. I'm a computational biologist in the group of Julio Sar Rodriguez at Uni Heidelberg. And today I'm just going to show a little bit of the work that we've been putting on analyzing single cell and spatial data, usually in the context of cardiovascular disease. And um, despite the high cost of single cell and spatial data, we have observed an increased amount of multi scale descriptions of tissues. And what I mean by this is that we have extended the descriptions that we had from bulk technologies, such as bulk transcriptomics, by focusing on cell-specific processes and their locations. And this gives us a unique opportunity to understand tissue architecture at the molecular level. Because on the one hand, we can start asking what are the organizational principles that ensure the function of organs, for example, the heart, uh, to what extent the organization of cells in space influence their behavior and vice versa. And finally, how do these spatial or organizational features can be associated to understand disease or cardiomyopathies in my case to, to be more specific. And this is very important in, in the context of heart failure because for example, after myocardial infarction, a series of inflammatory and reproductive responses trigger a widespread remodeling of the tissue. And uh, the compensation of these events causes heart failure and death. So a clear understanding of the inter and intracellular mechanisms, signaling mechanisms that regulate this remodeling is quite important. Um, so we recently made an analysis together with the group of Rafael Kraman and Ivan Kos in the University of Aachen, where we profile uh, 31 samples of 23 patients that encompass different physiological zones of myocardial infarction, as well as controlled myocardium. And for 28 of these samples, we took one uh, block of tissue from which we perform spatial transcriptomics with 10x Visium. Uh, and then for an adjacent region, we generated single nuke RNA seq and single nuke attack seq. So our main or the computational analysis was motivated by mainly two objectives. So we wanted to integrate all of these different modalities together with prior knowledge and computational methods to understand the tissue architecture of each of our slides. And on the other hand, we wanted to use those structural features and associate them with clinical covariates. So uh, for those who are not familiarized with 10X Visium, this is a capture-based spatial transcriptomics technology that has a characteristic to capture more than a single cell. So the resolution is not very good. And each uh, spot contains a community of cells that can be of the same time and a combination. So in order to better understand the tissue architecture, first we had to build a multiomics uh, cell atlas and we independently analyzed our single nuke RNA seq and attack seq samples, annotated them, clustered them using a state of the art methods. And we came up with a shared collection of 11 major cell types. And the, the advantage is that now we would have for each of these uh, classifications, information from gene expression 
and chromatin accessibility. And having this atlas would allow us now to focus on increasing the resolution of visium. So we can see this as two main challenges. On the one hand, we wanted to use this multiomic single cell atlas to map the specific locations of cells in space. And we wanted to add uh, functional information uh, using prior knowledge. And I'm happy to talk offline with all of the computational methodology that we had to do here. And this is in combination with tools that we've developed in the last couple of years and others in the field. Um, but doing this mapping alone is not leveraging the spatial information of our slides. So after we did this extensive and comprehensive mapping, then we started looking at spatial patterns of gene expression, cellular uh, compositions, uh, processes, for example, uh, and then started estimating spatial dependencies between cell types, between cells and functions, between functions, so that we can finally start um, generating putative potential communications. Um, and what this generates is a high resolution spatial map of different dis, uh, disease processes. So I'm showing you as a one example, um, a fibrotic scar uh, in which you can clearly see in the middle from the H and E staining that there's a, there's a scar in the middle. By doing all of our mappings, we are able first of all to look at the abundance of fibroblasts the main drivers of fibrosis, but not only that, we can also look at their processes, for example, their signaling pathway activity, teacher beta, a key, a key driver. We can go downstream and look at TF activities that are contextualized with our attack data, like E2F4. And finally, we can always look at gene expression. So, but the problem is that we can do this 28 times, but how do we actually use that information to actually uh, get uh, knowledge from the disease? How do we make a multi-scale comparison of conditions on patients. And this is not a trivial task because we have a collection of both structural and molecular characteristics of the tissue. So on the one hand, we have gene expression and chromatin accessibility for each of the major cell types for each of our patients. And on the other, we have the spatial organization of that information. Um, so one could think that what makes tissues different are different levels, right? One could, one could look at structural differences, for example, compositional that relate to differences in compositions of cell types or cell neighborhoods. So here I'm showing a really uh, broad abstraction of our Visium slides in which we um, annotated each of our spots as a muscle related spot, scar related spot, and immune related spot. And it's already visible that the differences between healthy areas to acute damage areas or ischemic areas and fibrotic, it's just an balance between fibro fibrosis-associated cells and immune-associated cells. And okay, if the compositions of these structures change, then we can also assess it. And this is what we call organizational. So those relate to how cells arrange within the tissues. And again, as an example, I'm focusing on the interaction between cardiomyocytes and, and vasculature uh, type of cells in which we see that in the fibrotic uh, conditions, they tend to localize more compared to the controls. And okay, if compositions and organization change, then it's very likely that we observe molecular differences. And this can be observed in two different aspects. So it can be a general gene expression shift that it's happening in all cells, for example, because of hypoxia, or this can be like a very cell type specific response. I don't wanna go in lots of details, but rather just show a single example of one of the major cell types in the heart, which is a cardiomyocyte, the component of the muscular part of, of, of our uh, organ. So we identify five um, major functional states of our cardiomyocytes that were shared both from a toxic and rna seq data. But we observed that there were three that were associated with a stress um, phenotype. So you go from a relatively healthy um, state that it's called cardiomyocyte one to an intermediate state that it starts to activate some of the stress related genes to a final stress state. And what we observe is that the compositions of these functional states was different uh, between our different uh, slides groups being more abundant in, in the ischemic or cell that region. But what is really important to notice is that we also got that state in, in, in the other conditions. So this does not mean that the disease is just caused by the emergence of a cell state. Uh, we validated these states because of course this could be like uh, an artifact of our analysis. And we, by using higher resolution spatial technologies like RNA scope, we were able to uh, differentiate these cell states that we uh, look at the nuclei level. 
And what is very interesting is that this shows like the power, the, the power of spatial transcriptomics, because if you give this, this slide to a pathologist, they wouldn't be able to differentiate damaged muscle from um, functional muscle. And what we can see from the transcriptional profile, it's a clear gradient between a functional muscle to a stress one. And this is associated with the border zone, which is very important in, in myocardial infarction uh, damage progression. Um, but now that we can map and contextualize these cell sets that we got from single cell, we can ask what may be the causes or the associations with other cell types. And we build spatially contextualized models and we identify that these cell types were present in all of our conditions, but the way they relate to other cells were different. For example, in myogenic and ischemic cells, they tend to co-localize more with BSMCs, vascular smooth muscle cells, um, or fibroblasts. And in the fibrotic, uh, sorry, uh, in, in myogenic, it's usually with vascular smooth muscle cells, while in the fibrotic uh, condition, you see more interactions with fibroblasts and myelin, saying that there's kind of a convergence of functions in different structures. Um, to summarize, I would just like to say that multi-scale omics data coupled to prior knowledge allows to bridge this gap between the structure and functions in tissues. Um, that multi-scale patient comparison is not trivial and needs to take into account lots of, of different characteristics of the tissues, mainly structural and molecular. And that multicellular and multi-scale modeling are open challenges in the field. Um, of course, I would like to say that all of these data is available in different platforms. And very importantly, I would like to take, thank Enrique, who is also in the call, because he helped us a lot to put all of these data set in, in the Human Cell Atlas. Um, with that, I would just like to acknowledge the people with whom we did the work, especially this is a collaborative work with the groups of Rafael Carman and Ivan Costa. And this work was led by, by me, Xian Li, and uh, Christoph Cook. And with that, I'm happy to take questions or to continue this offline. Thank you, Ricardo, for your presentation. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, we have, I, I, I lost, uh, okay. So uh, questions with, uh, with regards to the data and with regards to your method. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, an interesting question uh, that arises in, in this context, Ricardo, is how to, let's say reconcile the, the statistics of, of the multi-omic characterization with some known biology in, in order for, for this multi-parameter setting to be to some, to some degree interpretable. Yeah, this, this is more than necessary. And, and right now what we think that it's really important is to make these collective efforts with pathologists because they have done this for years. So they clearly understand how the tissues explain diseases. So now we just want to increase the resolution of that understanding. So I think it's elemental for any of these multi-scale studies to have a pathologist and a clear uh, question in mind. Else you just have a sea of knowledge that may be valuable, but it's really hard to prioritize. Okay, so you're, you're working with pathologists in, in this context? So in this context, we got this material that it's not very common. So these samples were selected to clearly study this remodeling process of the heart and pathologists help us to differentiate which was a class A and class B. However, I think there's a lot of space to develop on supervised methods to help them refine these classifications. And this is some of the work that we are also doing in the lab currently. Awesome, Ricardo. Well, thank you. We, we, we are a little bit uh, tight on the schedule, so it's, it's uh, our time to, to move on. Uh, and thank you. And for the last lightning talk of today, we are thrilled to present Professor Ignacio Bichman. Uh, Ignacio, you have our undivided attention, please. Thank you, Enrique, for an introduction. Uh, it's going to be hard to follow up on all these wonderful talks that have happened right now. I'm very, very excited to be here and to be showing you for the first time some of the results that we've been generating at, at our group. So very briefly, my name is Ignacio Wichman. I'm a visiting assistant professor at Stanford University at the G Lab and an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics in Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, in Chile. And today, what I'm going to be talking to you about is the process of identification of high-risk gastric precancer solutions by the integration of bulk, single cell, and spatial transcriptomics. So first, I'd like to thank everyone once again for being here and, and just starting the presentation. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about Right, is something that is known as gastric intestinal metaplasia. 
Now, gastric intestinal metaplasia is a precancerous lesion of the stomach, or it's known as such. And it is triggered usually by chronic infection by a bacterium called Helicobacter pylori. Now, chronic infection by H. pylori triggers chronic inflammation and infiltration of the gastric epithelial layer by neutrophils and mononuclear cells, including lymphocytes. And this chronic inflammation leads to the loss of the glandular tissue, right, in a process that is known as atrophy and replacement of the normal gastric epithelial lining for an, for an intestinal like epithelial lining with infiltration by absorptive enterocytes and also goblet cells that are usually not present in the stomach. Now, this is very important because gastric intestinal metaplasia can actually increase the risk of developing gastric cancer in future years. But this is not a linear uh, development of lesions in just one spot. It occurs throughout the entire stomach. So that is why the clinical implementation of the assessment of gastric cancer risk is deployed by uh, following the, the Sydney protocol, which take, takes five biopsies from the stomach from two distinct anatomic regions. One would be the top part, of the stomach, which is known as the, as the body, and the bottom part of the stomach known as the pyloric antrum. So one biopsy is taken from the lesser curvature, which is the inner curvature of the pyloric antrum. One is taken from the greater curvature in the pyloric antrum. The third biopsy is taken from the incisura angularis or angle of the stomach. And then you have two taken from the body, which are from the, from the lesser curvature and greater curvature. And then these are cross-tabulated to stage the patient according to a staging frame known as operative link on gastric intestinal metaplasia assessment or OGIM, where stages three and four have a 20 fold increase of developing gastric cancer compared to stages zero, one, and two. And what is important is that in these cases where gastric cancer actually occurs, uh, the progression occurs within two years from the, from the moment where they take the biopsy and the, that the patient is staged. So this is very relevant in the clinical setting. And this is more important if we consider that gastric cancer is the fifth most common cancer and the third cause of cancer death. And most gastric cancers are fatal because they're diagnosed at an advanced stage or curative treatment is no longer an option. That is where the gastric precancerous condition study from based in Stanford University and led by Dr. Robert Huang and Dr. Ju Ha Huang uh, has come to accrue samples and try to tackle this problem. So, Seeing that gastric intestinal metaplasia increases the risk for gastric cancer, GAPS is going to try to study these lesions to improve the non-invasive identification of patients with gastric intestinal metaplasia and to develop biological markers to predict the subset of intestinal metaplasias that might actually progress to gastric cancer. And this is where the study that I'm going to present to you is based, trying to identify at least the biological markers, tissue markers that might be predictive of increased gastric cancer risk and would aid the pathologist in risk stratification, at least at these stages. So, so far we have had uh, 44 samples in total, right? 40, 46 patients, sorry, that have been categorized using uh, a lesion categorization as normal, mild gastrointestinal metaplasia, moderate or severe gastrointestinal metaplasia that were then scored according to the old game staging frame. And this way we could categorize the samples into high risk lesions or low risk, low risk lesions. And we did comparisons between these two. We performed bulk RNA sequencing of these samples. And after differential expression analysis using a factorial design with a mixed model where we could account for duplicate correlation for paired samples from the body and corpus of some of these patients, we actually came to this list of differentially expressed genes where 398 genes were common between both anatomic re regions of the stomach and one interaction term that we had to rule out because the expression or the differential expression levels of this gene in particular differed between the antrum and the corpus. So we wanted really something that could tell us something about the gastric intestinal metaplasia disregarding the anatomic site where the lesion was taken. from. So we took this list of 398 genes and saved it for later. Now, in parallel with this, we performed weighted gene co-expression network analysis to identify models of genes that were co-expressed and identified in total 14 different co-expression modules. Now, these co-expression modules were associated then to our, our, our phenotypes, high-risk samples and low-risk samples. And from these, we focused mainly, after analyzing each of these modules, we focused on the brown module, which was very, very enriched in the high risk, which means that the expression levels of genes from the brown module were highly expressed in the high risk samples. And the other one was the purple module, which was highly expressed among the low risk, but expression was lost in the high risk samples. 
So using the intersection between the differential expression analysis and the weighted gene flow expression network, we came to a total of 314 differentially expressed genes that were also co-expressed and that were associated with a high risk signature. So these genes clustered most of the high risk old game samples in this manner, where we could see a very strong signal for genes that were downregulated in the high risk old games, as you can see up here, they're, they're, they're clustered here in the blue scale, most of the high risk that are consistent with the, with the severity of the lesions, right? And it didn't matter whether the samples were from the corpus or antrum, which is the top layer here. We can see genes which expression decreases and genes which expression increases in high risk. And among these, this cluster that we denoted cluster five had the strongest and the cleanest signal. So we took these genes and in collaboration with Anusha Sati from the lab, we actually mapped these genes to specific cell types using a, a gastric, a gastric um, premioplasia and gastric cancer cell atlas that she put together integrating 19 different samples from studies from the lab and additional sources. And we can see that these genes from the C5 cluster actually map to enterocytes, which are intestinal cells. So we're really capturing the intestinal metaplasia using this bulk data. And these also map to goblet cells, which also belong to the intestine, but we see a, an increase in the signal here in genes that map to stem-like cells, isthmic cells, and endocrine cells, which are also known to retain some stem-like cell properties. So this was very interesting to us because the cell of origin of gastric cancer is currently unknown. And it could be that somehow we, we are touching the cell in some way. And so then we use this data to spatially resolve this 105 gene signature to spatial data using the vision, the vision assay that was explained at the last talk. So this was done by Andrew Su, a brilliant PhD student from the lab. Now the pathologist here actually annotated the metaplastic lesion in this area and pit cells around this area, isthmus cells here, base cells here, and immune infiltrate around this area. And we can see that the, that the score of our 105 gene signature overlaps almost perfectly with the metaplasia. But not, not only that, we used the spatial data to refine the signature and curated it to a, to a list of only 15 genes that really highlights the metaplastic area. Now, this is, to us, it was absolutely new. We were not expecting to, get, to obtain this degree of resolution just from the bulk data. And in addition to that, we evaluated this in other samples from intestinal metaplasia. You can see here that the pathologist marked the metaplastic region around this area and this area. And what we got from the 15 gene signature highlights this exactly the same areas and in a very clean manner. In patient three, we can see a similar event where the metaplastic areas really, really highlighted of these 15 genes. And after this, we also annotated it. Well, this is another sample, right? Highlighting metaplasia here and here in these areas, just using these 15 genes. And we also wanted to see whether this metaplastic signature was carried over to cancer cells. So that's when we used the sample for one patient for now, in which we evaluated uh, how this expression signature was among the metaplastic area, which is here, the dysplastic area, which is kind of a inside to carcinoma. It's a carcinoma that has not evaded yet, and that it was present in this area of the biopsy, as well as down here, and cancer tissue around this area and this area. And we can see that the 15 gene signature is actually carried over from the metaplasia to the dysplasia, up here as well, to the dysplasia here as well, and also to the cancer. So this is not an innocent 15 gene signature. The signature is carried over from the stem cell compartment, probably to the differentiating cells in the intestinal metaplasia, and also carried over to the cancer cells. So these are cancer traits that appear before the onset of gastric cancer, or at least that's what we think. So to evaluate this, we went back to, to the single cell atlas that we had developed at the lab, and we can see that the 15 gene signature actually increases from normal tissue to non-atrophic gastritis, which is just the inflammation that I told you about in the first slide, chronic atrophic gastritis, which is the loss of the glandular, glandular tissue, right, in the atrophy stage, and then its replacement by intestinal metaplasia, and then to early gastric cancer, where the signature is at the highest in the single cell data as well. Now, when we divide this, by the cell types that are actually expressing the signature, we can see that it's expressed mostly by stem-like cells and enterocytes, which in our interpretation means that this is carried over from these cells over to the differentiated enterocytes that are present in the intestinal metaplasia as well. So to, sum, to summarize our findings so far, we have identified a highly specific signature for high-risk old patients that spatially resolves to metaplastic regions 
in the spatial data by the integration of this bulk single cell and spatial transcriptomic assays. And the signature pinpoints specific populations of stem-like cells and is passed on to the gastric cancer. So currently we are on the process of validating this and we are on the process of adding additional samples. So with this said, I would like to acknowledge the people at the G lab, Allison, Andrew, who would have done the spatial assays, Anuja with the single cell analysis, Sue Grimes and Han Lee for the funding. He's the head of the lab, as well as Ju Ha Huang and Robert Huang, who are leading the GAP study. Uh, my funding sources from Pontificia Universidad Católica and Agdis, and all the patients that donated their samples for this study to be possible. And also, I would like to thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to present the results, and I'll be happy to answer any questions now. Awesome talk, Ignacio, as, as always. Uh, it's, a, it's an impressive work. What is needed to, to move on this, uh, let's say, to one step closer to, to the clinic? I mean, it's so, impressive. One thing that we're working on right now is, as they said in the, in the last talk, the Visium assay shows an average of around 10 cells for each spot. So we actually got a small grant now to validate this using the RNA scope that was, acting, was also shown. And this way we can actually set apart the signal from these 15 genes to see whether they're all expressed in the same cells or maybe some of them are co-expressed just by some of the cells within specific areas. With that, we would like to pinpoint if they are in fact stem cells or stem-like cells. We're also working on copy number variation and genomic alterations in these cells and performing some, some analysis of clonal structures within the tissues to see whether there are some amplifications that might occur early in metaplasia. Some have been described before. We want to see if these occur and if these are passed on from the metaplastic cells to the cancer cells as well. So those are two issues that we're tackling right now and that we hope to finish sometime during the next month maybe. Okay, well, thank you really to all of uh, the lightning talks, great lightning talks for, for today. Take, thank you, Ignacio. And now uh, we're moving on, uh, Patricia. Hi, hi, Enrique. I think we're all here, right? Venice is also here, also Yesid. So, um, as yesterday, we are going to be uh, creating two breakout session rooms. So we're gonna share here in the chat, uh, the locations, the links for them. The idea like yesterday is to have one breakout session room for trainees and students, postdocs, and another one for uh, researchers, PIs who would like to discuss projects or collaborations. Uh, depending on the number of people in the sessions, we're gonna group them, right, in a, in a bit. And uh, yeah, we should start that in some 10 minutes. So you have time to go grab a coffee, stretch a bit, and then uh, we resume in some 10 minutes, okay?